each of you sitting here tonight is working hard every day to make the world a better and a healthier place. Whether you dispense pre-travel advice or you're splicing trypanosome genes, whether you're responding to the Ebola epidemic or designing a malaria refractory mosquito, the spirit that animates your work is one of beneficence, generosity, and peace. But we don't live in a beneficent and peaceful world. In 1903, the year that our parent society, the American Society of Tropical Medicine, was formed, 15 wars were taking place worldwide. Most of these were conflicts between an imperial power like the British Empire, or the Ottoman Empire, or the US, and much smaller, less powerful independence movements or indigenous peoples. Native American tribes like the Apache and Cheyenne or the Moro people of the Philippines. You can see that the big guy usually wins if you look at the column of, of uh, victors uh, and uh, losers there. Um, although I was interested to discover that Brazil actually seems to have handed a defeat to the US and, and Bolivia uh, back in 1903. You can also see that even 112 years ago, conflict in the Middle East and, and Saudi Arabia foreshadowed today's chronic violence in that part of the world. Several of these wars were fought over commercial interests. Both the Acre War on the Brazil-Bolivia border and the Bailundo Revolt in Angola involved rubber plantation workers who had re either revolted against forced labor or whose livelihoods were threatened by economic or political changes. Uh, on the left there, you can see that life hasn't gotten much better for many plantation workers in the last hundred years. Early, just earlier this year, mass graves containing the bodies of dozens of were found in forced labor camps on rubber plantations on the Thailand-Malaysia border. Tonight, as we sit here in the 64th annual meeting of the American Society of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene, no fewer than 54 wars are being waged worldwide, defining war as the use of armed force between two or more organized armed groups resulting in at least 100 deaths. Major wars, those resulting in more than 10,000 deaths in the last year are shown in brown. These include the conflicts in Syria, Iraq, and Afghanistan, and the Boko Haram insurgency in West Africa. Thousands have also died in the last year in each of another 14 conflicts in the Middle East, Asia, Africa, and, and one Europe, Ukraine. And I don't know about you, but sometimes I feel myself just exhausted by the constant drumbeat of grim news about wars, brutality, and suffering. As scientists and health professionals, how do we see ourselves and our work in relation to war and violence? Do we try to just set aside these disturbing Im images and continue to do our small part to make the world a little better? putting one foot in front of the other each day and hoping that our collective efforts will someday somehow win out against the forces of death and destruction. Maybe as individuals we do and maybe we should sometimes turn our attention away from all the bad news and focus on the good we can do through our work and in our communities and in our families. But as tropical medicine and global health professionals, as the ASTMH, we also have a long history of responding to the demands of wartime by making discoveries, by developing new treatments and creating new institutions that ultimately improve global health in important and lasting ways. The connection between wars and tropical medicine is, is obvious when you look at the map, whether you're looking at the map of malaria or neglected tropical diseases. There's simply more war in the tropical, less economically developed countries and, and more disease in war zones and conflict areas. This evening, I'm going to describe a few well-known examples of how we've transformed the destructive forces of war between humans into new weapons in the tropical disease agents, the viruses, parasites, and other bugs that we all do battle with and, and hope eventually to conquer. And then I'm going to tell you about some of my own recent experiences that have led me to think that maybe we can turn this equation around, some examples of how our work in tropical medicine and global health can serve as a way to promote peace. Uh, this won't be the first time that an ASTMH president has talked about the need for our society to step outside our comfort zone and in the lab or the, or the clinic or the field and get actively engaged in politics and advocacy. In his presidential address at the 1992 ASTMH meeting in Seattle, Don Krogstad told us that health has a universal appeal that transcends politics and is therefore a sound long-term investment in foreign relations that does not become outdated when political power changes hands. In Baltimore in uh, 1996, Don Burke called on us to become activists for tropical medicine and hygiene, telling us he believed that, that this society can be an important voice in a chorus calling out for international cooperation and common purpose to address global health issues. In Denver in 2002, Michelle Berry talked about globalization. And again, she challenged us to become activists arguing that ASTMH should, and I quote, 
be more of a public advocate for tackling the global health disparities that have widened dramatically during the era of globalization. And finally, just four years ago, here in Philadelphia, Peter Hotez introduced the idea that tropical disease elimination can serve as a means to implement international science diplomacy. And Peter pointed out the effects of, of tropical infections on promoting war and conflict and also the opportunity that shared suffering from tropical diseases provides for us to bring together uh, people together to achieve health goals. Tonight I want to look at things from a slightly different perspective. In addition to looking at how disease can promote conflict and how common suffering promotes cooperation on health goals, I want to think about whether there's potential for commonly shared public health aims to actually go the other direction and foster political and social reconciliation. Let's ask if tropical medicine can be a catalyst for peace. Something that Don Burke told us in his talk 19 years ago struck me as probably very true then, but, but maybe not quite so much still the case today in our much more globalized and, and connected world. Don analyzed how ASTH, ASTMH membership rises and falls in relation to wars, and he concluded that, I quote, membership in our society predictably surges during conflicts when U.S. national interests are perceived to be directly threatened by tropical disease and then stagnates in the inevitable post-war national doldrums. He goes on, the patterns are clear. It should come as no surprise that international politics drives tropical medicine and not the reverse. And this was indeed the pattern during our society's first century. Our membership did surge when tropical diseases like malaria and typhoid fever caused heavy troop casualties in World War II and, and, uh, and Vietnam. Our leading public health and research institutions likewise were created in response to and shaped by our war efforts. The Malaria Control in War Areas, or MCWA, was established in 1942 to combat malaria around military training bases inside the U.S. And after the war, the MCWA became the CDC, which at first stood for Communicable Disease Center. The NIH creation story goes even further back to 1887, when a one-room lab was set up at the Marine Hospital on Staten Island, New York, to monitor returning merchant seamen and to prevent epidemics of cholera and yellow fever from these returning travelers. In 1912, that, that Marine Hospital service became the public health service that we know today. And during World War I, the Public Health Service's hygienic laboratory, that, that one-room lab, investigated anthrax outbreaks among the troops, and they put the blame on contaminated shaving brushes, a, a story that, that then lived on in the form of a, of a comic book. That small lab became the National Institute, with no S, of health in 1930, and NIH expanded dramatically during another war, World War II, largely to develop vaccines for tropical diseases like typhus and yellow fever that were causing heavy troop casualties, and especially to make synthetic anti-malarial drugs. And so in parallel with the race to build a nuclear bomb, the German and American scientists were also in a race during World War II to find a new drug for malaria, which at the time could only be treated with quinine, which of course has to be extracted from the bark of the cinchona tree. Many thousands of allied soldiers died of malaria in the African and the Pacific theaters after the Japanese took control of the entire world's supply of quinine when they occupied Indonesia, where 90% of that quinine supply was produced on plantations on the, on the island of Java. And another pharmaceutical arms race took place during the Vietnam War. North Vietnamese troops started dying in large numbers along the Ho Chi Minh Trail, not from American bombs, but from chloroquine-resistant falciparum malaria. And at around the same time that the U.S. Army was embarking on a drug development program that ultimately produced mefloquine and, and other drugs that we know, the North Vietnamese turned to their neighbor in the north, China, for help. This was during Chairman Mao's Cultural Revolution at a time when most scientists were being shipped off to uh, re-education camps. Uh, and, and other, other intellectuals were being, uh, were being re-educated, but Chinese malariologists like uh, Dr. Uh, Tu Yu Yu on the, on the uh, right there and her colleagues were spared from the camps and asked to find a replacement for chloroquine. So combing through ancient records of traditional herbal treatments, they came across the plant Qinghao Su, which had been used for at least 2,000 years to treat intermittent fevers. In work that, uh, as you all know, was recognized a few weeks ago by a Nobel Prize, Dr. Tu and her colleagues carefully read these old texts, worked out how to extract the active compounds, the artemisinins, and they and others developed this life-saving class of anti-malarial drug that's used worldwide today in the form of artemisinin-based combination therapy. If you want more evidence of the connection between military action and advances in tropical medicine and global health, 
you can turn and look at the women and men sitting next to you. So many of the brightest lights in tropical medicine, from Ronald Ross and Walter Reed to our own Alan McGill, wore a military uniform and, like Alan, served in wartime. I'll never forget Alan describing to me how in, uh, in Iraq in 2003, he was just awed by the massive invasion force of war machines rumbling across the desert toward Baghdad. And his second thought after how just incredibly awesome that power was, was how much good we could do if even a fraction of the resources that were on display that day were deployed to fight tropical disease. So I think we can agree that while war, of course, has absolutely devastating negative consequences for global health, there's also an almost perverse calculus in which we might say that war has been good for global health and for tropical medicine in the sense that war and conflict have indirectly led again and again to life-saving new drugs, vaccines, surveillance tools, and institutions that ultimately may end up saving cumulative, cumulatively more lives than those that were lost in the wars. And as Don Burke observed, during the 20th century, our numbers in ASTMH and our funding in tropical medicine have indeed gone up during wartime and dwindled during peacetime. But I'm not sure that Don's, uh, Don's observation that international politics drives tropical medicine and not the reverse is still true today, or at least that it still has to be true. I believe and I hope to convince you that in the 21st century, tropical medicine and global health can become forces for political reconciliation and peace. In thinking about how we as individuals and as a, as a society respond to violence and war, I go back to my own childhood in South Dakota that Miriam uh, showed you a few, a few nice pictures of. My dad was an Episcopal priest, as she mentioned, ministering to the Lakota Sioux on, uh, in a little county between the Pine Ridge and Rosebud Reservations, and he did the circuit of chapels on, on the reservations uh, and right next to the South Dakota's Badlands. And you can see in this picture the teepees in the background behind uh, my mom and dad at this annual meeting of the, of the reservation churches. So the reservation has always been a, a violent place. In 1890, just 40 miles from the little town of Martin, where I grew up in South Dakota, the U.S. 7th Cavalry Regiment massacred 200 Lakota Sioux, mostly old men, women, and children, at Wounded Knee, a town of Wounded Knee on the Pine Ridge Reservation. And when I was in junior high school, a group of 200 Lakota Sioux occupied the same town of Wounded Knee to protest corruption and abuse on the reservation. U.S. Marshals and the FBI moved in. The shooting started. There were deaths on both sides, and before the tribal elders called an end to the protest, after more than two months of fighting. Um, so this was the background of my childhood. I personally experienced violence on more than one occasion, including uh, getting pretty badly beat up by, uh, at age 13 by four older high school boys. My response to getting beaten down and kicked in the face was to go buy a great big folding knife, <laughs> and I carried it in my back pocket to high school every day. Uh, it was a different, a different time. I don't think I could do that today. You can't even bring a clock to school today. But, you know, that's a natural response to violence, you know, to get a weapon, to learn karate, to form a militia, to fight. And uh, I know someone else who had the same response to violence, initially at least. So this is a photo of uh, four fifth-year medical students at Rangoon University in Myanmar, the Southeast Asian country formerly known as Burma. Some of you might recognize the one on the left, uh, the one wearing a trench coat over her uh, traditional Burmese lodgy. Uh, she's always had a good fashion sense. I'll, I'll come back to her in just a minute. <laughs> um, but these, uh, these students' lives were shattered just a few months after that photo by a violent uprising in Burma. Students, including medical students, were at the forefront of national protests against the ruling military regime. The students actually briefly seemed to carry the day, and they convinced a young academic, Aung San here, giving her first public speech, surrounded by student activists, they convinced her to be their leader. But that heady moment didn't last. The, the protests were brutally put down by the military. Peacefully protesting nurses and students were gunned down in the street. Thousands were killed. Many more were imprisoned. Others went into exile. Large numbers of Burmese students congregated on the Burma-Thailand border where they linked up with some of the ethnic armies that had been fighting the military government for independence for decades. The students had a very understandable response to the violence that had been inflicted on them. They armed themselves and they tried to raise an army and go back to take on the Burmese military. The student on the left in this photograph holding a gun is the same one you saw <laughs> wearing a trench coat over her laundry in the earlier photo. Uh, the student's plan to fight didn't get very far. The military government in Burma stayed in power and became increasingly isolated and xenophobic. Economic sanctions imposed by the U.S. and other Western countries only increased the isolation. 
Most of the students eventually gave up the fight, scattered to the four winds, and tried to rebuild their lives elsewhere. Our young medical student, pictured above, lived briefly in Thailand as an illegal immigrant and then sought asylum in England before coming to the U.S. where she started her medical training all over again, doing pre-medical studies, medical school, clinical training, and a Ph.D., eventually becoming a malariologist. For many years, she was unable to go home to Burma, now called Myanmar. She was blacklisted by the government, and she would have gone, if she'd gone back, she would have gone straight from the airport to prison. She remained bitterly opposed to any sort of engagement with the Myanmar government, and she fully supported the sanctions. There was another major anti-government uprising in Myanmar in 2007, this time led not by students, but by Buddhist monks who were highly respected and revered in Burmese society. This time the whole world was watching. But despite the international attention, the government's response was the same. More guns, more violence, more deaths. Our former young student rebel was dismayed. She had always believed that if only the rest of the world, and especially the United States, had known what was happening in 1988, they would have intervened. After seeing the Saffron Revolution end the same way that the 88 uprising did, this time, despite the whole world watching it unfold on the internet and doing nothing to help, our former student rebels' thinking changed. Raising an army to fight back was futile, decades of sanctions, and done nothing. Maybe it was time to take a different approach. By the time this one-time rebel, who you may have been figuring out, is my wife, ASDMH member Myang Myang Nyut, by that time she was married to and working with another malaria researcher. Together, the two of us decided to reach out to our fellow malariologists inside Myanmar. Slowly and quietly, in 2009, we began collaborating with both civilian and military government malaria researchers. We chose to work with the Burmese military, despite their human rights record, for several reasons. First, many of the places in Myanmar where the most malaria is are in conflict areas that only the military can reach. We just can't make progress against malaria in Myanmar without working with the military. That's just a fact, alongside with the Ministry of Health and the private sector. And we found that there were some very well-trained and dedicated doctors and scientists working on malaria in the military, people who shared the motivation that we all have to improve the health of their countrymen. And finally, by engaging the military medical corps, we hope to begin building links between the military and other groups within Myanmar who have been working in isolation from each other. We were the first foreign visitors to the Defense Services Medical Research Center in the hills outside the capital, Napidaw, in 2011. And so here you have the former rebel not only shaking hands with uniformed Burmese soldiers, but working with Brigadier General Dr. Tin Mao Lang, pictured here, and his team to conduct molecular surveillance in support of malaria elimination. Not long after we started working there, things started changing for reasons that still aren't very clear. Aung San Suu Kyi was released from nearly two decades of house arrest in 2010, and the military government transferred power to at least a nominally civilian government in 2011, albeit one dominated by very recently retired military officers. In 2012, the U.S. resumed full diplomatic relations with Myanmar, and the next year, both Secretary of State Clinton and President Obama visited and met both with the President, Thin Sein, a picture on the left, and opposition leader Aung San Suu Kyi on the right. This thawing of relations made it possible for us to get the first ever NIH grant to work inside Myanmar with Myanmar government scientists. And this grant, in turn, gave us an opening to organize training and ethics for our collaborators, including the military. As you know, in order to get U.S. federal funding for any kind of human subject research, institutions have to have an ethical review committee, or IRB, and that IRB has to have, if they're going to get federal money, they have to have what's called a federal-wide assurance from the U.S. Office for Human Research Protection certifying their IRB meets uh, several criteria to assure protection of human subjects. It's essentially a license to do human research. And one important way of building political will for malaria elimination, Myang and I thought, is to build local capacity for malaria research and surveillance. Part of Myang's vision is also to use malaria research as a way to start the conversation in Myanmar about things like ethics and professionalism, things they really haven't had conversations about in their years of isolation. And so with support from the Fogarty International Center, Myang organized training workshops in research ethics and helped both the civilian and military IRBs get their federal-wide assurances from the U.S. government. And despite the importance of human rights issues in Myanmar, overtly using human rights as a framework for discussion with the Myanmar government at that delicate time just wasn't realistic. But what is the protection of human subjects and informed consent if not human rights? And so here we had the formal rebel training the soldiers 
in ethics. Miang also convinced George Soros, with, through his Open Society Foundations, to support training in clinical ethics and professionalism for medical students. One of her projects is called Malaria as a Catalyst for Social Change. Her idea was to use the shared goal of combating malaria to try to build new trust and cooperation between the diverse groups in Myanmar, including not just civilian and military malaria workers, but also community-based organizations associated with the armed ethnic militias in border areas who had long histories of conflict and fighting with the government. Malaria affects everybody, soldiers and rebels, farmers, gold miners, and rubber plantation workers. Even if the government and border groups are unable to reach political agreement, surely, we hope, they can agree to eliminate malaria. And maybe, just maybe, starting a conversation and getting agreement about shared health goals like malaria elimination could help establish the beginnings of trust and understanding where there was none before. And of course, there have been other examples of using shared health goals to foster peace, at least for a little while. In El Salvador, Sri Lanka, Afghanistan, many other countries, warring parties have agreed to temporary ceasefires to allow people on both sides to be vaccinated against smallpox, polio, childhood diseases. But these days of tranquility are only temporary. One day the shooting stops so the vaccination teams can do their work, the next day the shooting starts again. Can we use shared health goals to pursue a more permanent peace? As you know, our president last year, Alan McGill, brought Bill Gates to ASTMH as our keynote speaker. We had also invited the Myanmar National Malaria Control Program Manager and the director of the equivalent of the NIH in Myanmar, shown here just in front of Bill and, and Alan. Uh, we invited them to the meeting and they got to meet Bill and Alan. And later during the meeting, Alan sat down with our Myanmar colleagues and made a suggestion. Even though Myanmar has the most malaria of any country in Southeast Asia and many challenges to overcome, Alan said, was it possible that Myanmar could make a decision to be not the last country in the region to eliminate malaria? Shortly before the ASTMH meeting last year, Alan had come to Myanmar for the first time, and he came away very impressed with the quality and commitment of diverse members of the malaria community, not only from the government, but also from the private sector and NGOs. Most of these organizations had previously had very limited interaction with the Ministry of Health and none at all with the military. But Alan could see the potential for cross-sectoral cooperation as Myanmar began to open up. Alan's specific suggestion to our Myanmar visitors last year was, could malaria elimination serve as a national reconciliation campaign in Myanmar, much like Nelson Mandela made winning the World Cup a national goal to help reconcile post-apartheid South Africa? The, the very next month, we brought together civilian and military, public and private partners to plan surveillance for malaria elimination. Here you can see on the left uh, a leading Ministry of Health malaria expert, and next to him uh, the country director of an NGO that had a long history of working with ethnic groups on the border in areas not controlled by the government. Um, and uh, next to him the Brigadier General, our, and next to him uh, our former rebel, now a malariologist, they're having lunch together and sharing a laugh. Just a couple years earlier this scene would have been just inconceivable. Some of the results from this malaria mapping project were presented a couple of days ago at a symposium, including partners from the Ministry of Health, uh, a young army officer from the Ministry of Defense, and, uh, and from the NGO that works in the border areas. Another partner in this work is the Chinese CDC, who are uniquely able to reach malaria-affected populations in Kachin and Shan states along the China-Myanmar border. They're out of reach of the government malaria workers inside Myanmar because they're, they're contested areas. And just this last August, we took this malaria diplomacy approach to another level. Together, ASTMH, the University of Maryland's new Institute for Global Health, and the Center for Strategic International Studies, which is a bipartisan think tank in Washington, uh, together we worked on malaria elimination in Myanmar. The goal was to bring together this diverse group of partners from Myanmar, many of whom had a long history of adversarial relationships and who had never sat down together to talk about anything and try to get them to agree to work together to eliminate malaria from Myanmar. Uh, we were told that it wouldn't work, that the opposition politicians would never agree to sit down with the government, everybody is trying to look good in the election coming up, uh, that the ethnic health organizations would have nothing to do with the military who have been shooting at them for decades, and that our own State Department would never approve visas for high-ranking military officers to travel to the U.S. We were told you couldn't get above the level of colonel, you have to get a jade waiver, and it's just it was going to be impossible. But I'm happy to report the event did happen, and it was a success. We had the Deputy Minister of Health from Myanmar, uh, the Senior Health Advisor to the President of Myanmar, 
uh, members of parliament, both from the government party and the opposition party, Aung San Suu Kyi's uh, NLD, th that party. Uh, we had Suu Kyi's senior political advisor, uh, an official from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, two brigadier generals from the Myanmar Defense Medical Services, and four leaders of ethnic health organizations from conflict areas on the border. They all showed up in DC for this conference, and they were joined by leaders from the US President's Malaria Initiative, Gates Foundation, World Bank, Asia Pacific Leaders, Malaria Alliance in the US military, and WHO and the Global Fund uh, sent statements of support. Um, I'll admit it was a little tense at first, but over the course of two days, we saw new understanding and, and especially trust begin to blossom between these former adversaries. Uh, there was one night when we went to have dinner at the, the home of the Burmese ambassador in, in the US, Myanmar ambassador, excuse me, I still get mixed up uh, which is which. Um, and one of the guys from the, the ethnic border areas, uh, this uh, gentleman, in the white shirt in the, in the, on the lower right there uh, from Karen State. He was so tired and jet-lagged he couldn't go that night. And so the deputy minister of health realized he wasn't there. She got them to pack up some boxes of Burmese food, and he was really suffering with the American food. She got someone to find out where his hotel room was and knocked on the door, woke him up, and gave him this Burmese food, and he was just so happy. <laughs> it, was, it, was really, it was really wonderful. Um, so this was a closed door meeting and we saw by the end of the meeting some really open and frank exchanges. People, you know, related their anxieties and there were reassurances given. It was, it was really something to see and just it really exceeded my expectations. And ultimately all the partners agreed to work together on national malaria elimination, to, to work together on a national malaria elimination campaign. Uh, there was consensus that malaria elimination was too important and too urgent to wait for political developments like a fully free and fair election or a national ceasefire. The malaria elimination would proceed and they would work together on it, no matter which way the political winds were blowing, whether in Myanmar or here in the US. The meeting was widely covered by the media, both uh, here and in the region and in the country, including the, the Myanmar language media. And right now a costed national strategic plan for malaria elimination is being drafted in an inclusive process that includes all the partners, including the ethnic uh, border groups, even as politics marches on. They have an election coming up uh, in, in the next week or so, national election. But can we credit the consensus on malaria elimination for a ceasefire or if the elections go well? Of, of course not. But I do think we can say with some confidence that tropical medicine and global health have had a meaningful, positive impact on political relationships in this emerging democracy. Health is an area where adversarial partners can agree when they can agree on little else. And it gives everybody an opportunity to look good, to take shared credit for doing something that's good for their people. As the leading professional scientific organization in the world for tropical medicine and global health, I believe that ASTMH is uniquely positioned to leverage the scientific and public health diplomacy that's already a part of what we do every day and amplify it for greater impact beyond the lab and the clinic to benefit the broader societies. We just had an exa another example of how we can use our voice uh, in the symposium on bridging uh, between U.S. and Cuba. We have uh, with us this evening Dr. Jorge Delgado uh, and Professor Maria Guadalupe Guzman, who respectively have uh, led the human efforts on Ebola in West Africa and, uh, and a leading virologist uh, who's, who's widely published. Uh, third speaker, Dr. Uh, Gerardo uh, Guillen, uh, wasn't able to make it. Um, but it was just a fantastic uh, uh, symposium we just had uh, that uh, really exemplifies this, this kind of scientific diplomacy. So our name is the American Society of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene, of course. And while we recognize that the leadership that Americans took to initially establish this society a century ago, we also recognize that we're now a very international society. As a result of some recent steps that make it easier for our low and low to, and low and low to middle income country colleagues to join, membership is now just about a third from outside the U.S. and we expect that very soon we'll be uh, at least half international. And the ASTMH Council is looking at ways to do more to bring the rich voices of our diverse membership to the society. I hope that soon you'll be listening to the President's address being, give, being given by someone from Bamako or Beijing or Lima. I reminded us earlier of, of the calls by previous presidents for us individually and collectively to take up the tools of advocacy and diplomacy to improve global health. As a scientific and public health community, we bring a unique and neutral role to the policy and advocacy table. We don't have a hidden agenda. Our commitment is to improved health and is not rooted in a political party or in service to some political vision. 
Our political party is the human party. Let's make it part of our mission and part of our routine to reach out to non-traditional partners, think tanks like CSIS, members of Congress, whether from red states or blue states, even military rulers and armed militias, and find ways to promote peace and work together to achieve our vision, a peaceful world free of tropical disease. Let's put ourselves out of business. Thanks.